Serving God is an amazing journey, isn't it? Amazing adventure. Father, thank you for what you're doing around the world. God, not just through one ministry, but Lord, through your church. And God, we bless what you are blessing in the nations. But Lord, right here in our nation, God, thank you that we are at a season of outpouring, a season of opportunity, a season of grace, a season of victory. God, a season of, as was prophesied earlier, the reign of renewal and revival in the land. Now, God, would you speak your word to us corporately and individually? God, help me to go beyond myself, not in preaching style, but God, that you would declare what is on your heart and give us ears to hear what the Spirit's saying to the church. And Father, we pray that you would accomplish your purpose. Nothing more, nothing less. God, we will not add to it, but Lord, we hold nothing back. So Father, accomplish your purpose. Jesus, may your name be glorified. And we thank you, Father. Amen. I'm going to get to Elijah in just a moment. But as we were driving here uh, from our hotel over in Kissimmee, uh, God began stirring some things in my heart that I wanted to share with you first. In Genesis chapter 11 is a story about Abraham back before he was named Abraham, when he was still called Abram. If you remember, uh, Abram grew up in Ur of the Chaldeans. It was a city and a land that served idols. And in the midst of that, the voice of Jehovah came and said to leave the land of your father's birth and go to a land I'm going to show you. And there became uh, the promise of Canaan land and destiny in the promised land. So Terah, who is Abram's father, uh, took Abram, took the family, and they set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. I want you to listen to what it says here in chapter 11, verse 31. So Terah took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, the wife of his son Abram, and together they set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. All right, so I want you to get the picture here. They were called out of sin. They were called out of idolatry. They were called out of the past into their future and their destiny. But it says this, when they came to Haran, which was a city about halfway between Ur and Canaan, when they came to Haran, they settled there. So get the word settled. They left the place of bondage to go to the place of promise, but they settled before they got to the place that they were called to. Let's look at another scripture. Joshua chapter 18. So Joshua in verse 3, Joshua said to the Israelites, how long will you wait before you begin to take possession of the land, the rest of the land that the Lord, the God of your ancestors has given you? Now we love the story of Joshua. When I was in Bible college and first began, uh, you know, preaching uh, like, like that full time as a 23 year old, I remember I used to preach on the Joshua generation all of the time. It was my favorite stories in scripture. But you know, after the great, uh, 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 the, the great victory of Jericho, they shouted, they blew the trumpets, they marched around the walls, the walls fell, they go in, they take the city. After the mighty victory, we come to Joshua 18 to find that the people, instead of claiming the entire land, Settled. I believe one of the greatest hindrances to the kind of revival that shakes and changes cities and nations is the fact that we settle instead of pursuing all that God has called us to. Now, you are an apostolic people, you are led by a fivefold ministry group and team with an apostolic father. And most of us here have heard that an apostolic ministry, it's a breakthrough anointing. It's a pioneering anointing. It's an entrepreneurial anointing. And I agree with that. But there's a dimension of apostolic anointing that I've not seen fulfilled in great dimensions in America. And that's when Paul said in Timothy, he said, I have finished the course. See, apostolic anointing is not, in my opinion, so much about starting things as it is finishing things. Because visionaries can start things, but apostolic people will finish what God has called us to do. One of the anointings, I believe, for 2017 and beyond 
as God is calling us back, I believe, to the initial vision that we gave up on. God is calling us back to what it was. Joshua mentioned earlier, back to our first love and that fire. And I believe out of that first love fire comes the first love vision that God has purposed us to. And along the way, we get distracted, we get dismayed, we get discouraged. And I believe the Lord is saying, I want to bring you back to where you start believing again for what I initially put in your heart. You know, back, um, I don't know, two, three years ago, I got to introduce Shekinah to one of those 1980s movies that I watched as a, uh, as, as a teenager and, and young adult called Back to the Future. <laughs> Other than a little language, I thought it was a pretty cool movie. But you know, the way God has praised in me prophetically is this. He's taking us back to our start for our future. And so I want to challenge us from the story of Elijah that we've got to finish what God has begun. Now let's look at the story of Elijah. I'm not going to take all of it apart. 1 Kings 16, 17, and 18. God raised Elijah up in the days of Omri and the days of Ahab and Jezebel. Omri was Ahab's father. And it says that Omri was the most evil king that Israel had seen at that point in time. But then Ahab, his son, came up and said he was now the most evil king. He surpassed his father in evil. There's a principle, maybe you've heard it put this way, what parents allow in moderation, their children will practice in excess. When we allow compromise in our life, when, we, when, when the younger generations see in us that we give a little inch to the world, the flesh, and the devil. If we're not careful, our young people are going to take it to a greater extreme. And so we've got to be very careful because I have found something in the church that disturbs me in America, and that is that we are all about our rights. I have a right to talk like this. I have a right to watch this. I have a right to drink this, whatever it might be. I'm not talking about legalism here, but why is it so much about your rights? You've heard it before. Dead people have no rights. <laughs> Heard somebody say it this way. God really is not interested in changing you. He wants to kill you. <laughs> I'm crucified with Christ. We live in a culture that prides itself on taking offense at everything that happens. But the same thing happens in the church world. And we take offense on ourselves. Somebody has the audacity to talk to us about holiness. But can I tell you, it may not send you to hell doing that, drinking that, listening to that, watching that, saying that. But when the younger generation watches you and I as adults compromising a little, what right do we have to tell them live as holy people? But on the opposite, if they see a heart going after God, then they take it beyond where we've been. Legacy, the whole meaning behind your name and your identity. So Elijah was raised up in the days of Ahab and Jezebel. God took him from Tishbe, a little town outside of Samaria. It was a rural area. Doesn't talk about it in any other way else in Scripture. He is what I call the redneck prophet. God went and found somebody that had no degrees, seemingly had no uh, built-in platform. And God said, I'm going to put you before the king and you're going to declare the word of the Lord. And so Elijah finds himself before King Ahab. He's in the palace. And instead of trying to curry favor, instead of trying to get himself an office at the palace, instead of trying to get the money of the king, he has the audacity, the spiritual guts to look him in the face and without any political correctness to say, you are a sinner, you are an idolater, and because of you, our nation is now serving idolatry and is coming under judgment. See, today, prophets many times want to prophesy how you're going to be rich and wealthy and famous. And all you know, God is glorified when he does those things if we keep our hearts humble. But can I tell you something? It is time that somebody, and look, God help us. And please hear my heart on this. I voted for Trump, whether you did or don't. But God help us that God had to find somebody like that because the prophetic church has been silent. 
I pray for him. I love him. I believe he's the right man for the right time. But can I tell you, I believe God looked for a reprobate and a heathen that's coming to the Lord because the church has been silent. We have been trying to curry the favor of the government and the culture instead of confronting culture. So the prophet confronted the king and the government, said there's going to be a drought. And you know what happened? God took care of his man. There was water, the, the brook Cherith, the water not yet uh, dried up from the land. Ravens came, brought bread and meat. But how many of you know ravens don't necessarily bring Ruth's Chris steak? They bring roadkill. Oh, yes, I had somebody say, oh, Raven, the only place ravens could find meat was in the king's palace, and he was eating the best of the king. Preach it all you want. I don't believe that. I believe he was eating roadkill and was thankful. You know one way God will test your heart? Will you be thankful? I've got a 2002 minivan that getting here from preaching in the comas today, every 10 miles I was having to pull over and let it cool off for five minutes to get it another 10 miles. Is that what kind of vehicle I want? No, sir. But am I thankful I'm here? Yes, I am. There comes a point in time that we're not living for the here and the now. I was in a meeting one time where an awesome evangelist was preaching about sowing for souls. Not just money, but sowing for souls. And he began, he said, we're going to have a celebration of the harvest of souls. And a lot of people were there, and, you know, people clapped a little bit. Yay! And then the next speaker talked about a harvest for money. Man, the place went nuts! Wow. And I thought, God help us. Yeah. If we're more interested in the money in our pocket than in the souls for the kingdom. I'm not against the money. Don't misunderstand me. But where is our treasure? The inheritance promised to a son is not about money. The money will be there. It will be the souls and the nations. Anyway, the brook dried up. God said to Elijah, I'm going to take you to a millionaire because I use millionaires. <laughs> right? No, no, no. He said, I'm going to take you to a widow. And so Elijah said, he goes to the widow woman, Zarephath, excuse me, ma'am, can, can I have a drink? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'll get you a drink. Well, excuse me, uh, while you're getting the drink, can you give me some bread? Well, sir, I only have a little bit of flour and oil. I, I'm about to eat, my, my, my son and I are going to eat a, a meal, and we're going to die. You know what the prophet said? He said, go ahead. Do what you said. What did she just say she was going to do? Eat and die. The prophet said, go ahead, eat and die. But give me your food first. Let's take the offering now. <laughs> no. it, it, they, look, I know people can use manipulation, but we've got to have ears to hear the spirit because it can be the same words in a different spirit. That woman recognized the spirit of God and she gave out of her need. You know the story. There was abundance. But then God said to Elijah, I want to demonstrate myself to this nation. And Elijah came back, said to the king, get the nation together. You know what? There's coming a prophetic people in America that when they say to the government, get the nation together, the government's going to say, yes, sir. God is bringing forth his government in the church to the point that the governments and leaders of the world are going to listen to what we have to say. So he gathered the people together. Two million scholars say in Israel at the time. And there was a contest. Follow God if he's God. Follow Baal if he's God. People said nothing. Elijah said, let's have a contest. Which God answers by fire. So he let, he let the opposition go first. Do you know the story? They put the bull on the altar. They began to shout, scream, holler from morning to noon, noon to evening, beating themselves, making absolute, as Shekinah always call it, dorks of themselves. Absolute fools of themselves. Maybe that's the teenage word now. But... Uh, and, and, and Elijah, again, he wasn't politically correct. Thank God for the non-politically correct spirit. Because he said, shout louder, maybe your God's on vacation. <laughs> Anybody remember the Living Bible from years ago? It had Elijah saying, shout louder, maybe your God's sitting on the toilet. 
Can you imagine a prophet today calling out a false god? <laughs> and saying maybe he's sitting on the toilet? Let me tell you, the prophetic anointing is not about making people feel good all the time. It's about confrontation with truth in love for redemption. So Elijah said, come here. He rebuilt the altar of the Lord, which was in ruins. The altar is not just a place of prayer. It's a place of sacrifice. As Americans in the church, we have not been taught sacrifice. We've been taught that God's the great big Santa in the sky, that if you can just get the formula right, say the right words in the right order, throw money at the right time, you can get what you want. But Elijah rebuilt the place of sacrifice. As the apostle said earlier about the message of fire that God had given him, there's a place of the fire of God consuming and purging. And Elijah said a very simple prayer. But before he did, he had them dig a trench around the, 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 the altar and pour water on it. Now, what had not happened for more than three years? It hadn't rained. So what did they have very little of? Water. And so Elijah said, pour out what you have almost none of. Do it again. Do it a third time. That makes absolutely no sense. I am almost out of money. I'm out of everything. And God says, give it all. Do it again. Let's take a third offering. <laughs> Not because God needed the water, but he wanted them fully dependent on him. You say, God is not an angry God with his sons and his daughters, but there are times he must test us to the point of seeing where our trust is, where our faith is taking us to the last of the last of the last of what we have. Then Elijah prayed a very simple prayer. Wasn't, no, wasn't any fanfare. He wasn't trying to impress anybody by using prophetic words. He used to be King James. Now we try to use prophetic words, the buzzwords. You know, uh, kingdom this and, and download. Oh, everything's a download now. I, you know, that was never around the prophetic movement. We started in the 80s. And everything's, oh, a download from heaven. And I'm like, yeah, you know, you've been around the buzzwords. And, you know, and I'm not against it, but we know how to use kingdom buzzwords, don't we? Elijah was not trying to impress anybody. He just said, God answered by fire. So the people know that you're God. You've sent me. And you're, caught, you're turning their hearts back again. When I was a teenager, I loved Elijah. And I used to think, God, get him with fire. I, you know, I was a street preacher at the time. I was 15 years old. And I, I remember one time, and I lived in some apartments up in Virginia. And I heard some guys out behind there. And they were beating the guy senseless and cussing and, and just everything else. I went up and said, if you don't quit cussing, God's going to get you. You know, I didn't have a whole lot of wisdom or love or anything else. I was just, God's going to get you. And so my idea of a prophet and calling fire was, God, burn them up. <laughs> but how many of you know the fire that Elijah called down was not a fire of judgment? It was a fire of demonstration. God is not wanting to destroy a people. He's wanting to demonstrate to a people that he is the one true God. So the way I pray it is this, God, let there be a visible, physical manifestation of your glory. Not one of these nice little, are any of you tired sometimes of having to pretend? Charismatic meetings? I get into these times when people say, oh, don't you feel the presence of God here when it's completely dead and you want to stand up and say, no, it's dead. You know, you pray for somebody to get healed. You know, the arm's been hurting. Is, is, is your arm better? Well, I, 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 maybe a little because we want to pretend. There's a place of faith, yes. But realistically, in the spirit-filled movement, we walk in self-deception. And how can God trust us with the kind of power that shakes nations if we cannot even be real with ourselves about what's in here. 
I've been in one or two meetings where gold dust is flying around. Kim's seen glory clouds and all those. I love it when God does that kind of stuff. But you know what? I've been in meetings where somebody's hand is sweaty and they got it under a light and it glistens and they go, oh, look, it's the glory. I'm going, no, you're sweating. Get a rag. <laughs> How many of you want the real thing? Elijah said, God, let there be no doubt. Yes. Visible, physical manifestation. Why? Not so we can have church, but so they will know your God. Yes. Yes. The fire came. The people repented. And here's where we go back to where I started. Elijah could have said, we've had revival. Now I'm going to be on charisma or whatever. I believe one of the greatest problems in the American charismatic movement is we have a touch of God, a move of God, a revival of God, a miracle of God, a prophetic word from God, and we get excited and then stop. We settle. And I believe one of the reasons why the moves of God, and whether you want to name Toronto, Pensacola, or anywhere else, I believe, and I'm not throwing stones of accusation. I'm saying look at ourselves. I believe one of the reasons they haven't continued on into nation shaking and shaping restoration and re re reformation is because we get satisfied and excited right there. We're no longer in the past. We're no longer in the dead of the, of, of, of the graveyard where we've moved on, but we're not fully there. We're apostolic because we started something, but we have not finished something. Elijah knew God had something more than fire. He had rain because God wanted to restore what the enemy through sin had stolen away. I was preaching in Washington, D.C. at a conference on the Sunday morning at a church. The conference was Lance Wall now. It was uh, uh, George and Banoff and some of these others. And they're praying. It's a church we've been working at for a year and a half uh, called Embassy Church. It, it backs up to Vice President Biden's ex president, Vice President Biden's home. Uh, ambassadors go there, all this other stuff. And God's given us uh, entrance there and, and preaching. And I love all that God has done. But can I tell you one of my biggest concerns for those that were prophesying Trump and praying for Trump is they think the battle's won. I remember, I'm old enough to remember in the 1980s when 500,000 Christians and 800,000 Christians gathered in Washington, D.C. to pray. And, and especially white Christians thought that when Reagan got in, that was the answer for America. I believe... We stopped short. I believe we're in a place that if we as the church think the battle is already won because many people's candidate got into office, then we have stopped short of the goal. We've settled. Thank God. We pray for them, believe for them, but it's not starting at the White House. It's in God's house. Your house. My house. And so Elijah put his face to the ground between his knees and cried out, God, restore the land. Bless the land. Six times, seven times, sees a cloud the size of a man's hand. All it took was just that one glimpse of God's promise. And you know what happened? Elijah went to Ahab and said, hitch up your chariots and horses. Get ready because there's a sound of the abundance of rain. But then here's one of the things I love. Elijah tucked his cloak into his belt. It says, and ran faster than the horses and chariots. Let me tell you something. God's apostolic prophetic people have got to not only declare to the kings and leaders what's about to happen, we've got to run faster than them because we must be ahead of them. We don't follow them. They follow us. I love the way Ephesians chapter 1 puts it. It says, uh, Paul praying for the church at Ephesus, God given the spirit of wisdom and revelation. But then it says in the message uh, paraphrase on, it says, therefore you see the church is not peripheral to the world. The world is peripheral to the church. We are not the little David fighting the big Goliath out there of culture. Jesus is the centerpiece of his story. The church built around it. And we are to be the ones that set 
the way culture and government goes. So there is a prophetic acceleration coming as we go back to the initial thing that God had called us to, and we're going to run ahead of even the leaders around us. I'm going to close with this thought. After the great contest, the prophets of Baal, the fire, the nation turns to God, the rain begins to come, the prophets are, are killed, the false prophets, and we see Elijah the next day saying, God, I've had enough. Let me tell you, a prophetic word is not enough to sustain you. A miracle is not enough to sustain you. It takes what the girls and, and Joshua were leading us in singing. It takes intimacy. It takes a daily walk with God. And why was Elijah uh, contemplating the end of life? Because Jezebel had been defeated in a battle, but had not been dethroned. Now, please hear my heart. I love the ministries that are around our nation. But I think sometimes prophetic ministries in particular, they declare things before it is really time. We get a revelation. A couple, three, four years ago, there were some prophetic and prayer ministries that had a celebration and a ceremony where they divorced Baal in our nation. I believe in that, but when I look at the reality, we have not divorced Baal. Well, we live in Hampton, Virginia. 15 minutes from our home is where the first slaughter of Native Americans happened. It's where the first slaves from Africa were brought onto the continental U.S. And so through the years, everybody and their brother you can think of, we've been there shouting, screaming, you know, uh, banging drums, waving banners, uh, you know, clanging bells, and you know, all the other things you do in the, you know, that movement. I love it. But I guess I've got to ask, how many times do I have to repent of the sins of the fathers? How many times do I have to scream again? How many times do I have to blow the shofar again? Please hear me. I believe in all of that. But there comes a wake-up call of saying, do we just continue doing the same thing and expect different results? That's the definition of insanity. It's time that we press on. It's time we stir ourselves up out of where we've settled and we press on to the victory God has called us to walk in. And so how did Elijah do this? Yes, God fed him. God gave him water. The angels appeared. The still small voice of the Lord came. But here's what Elijah did. He raised up a son. His name was Elisha. Elisha raised up sons called the school of the sons of the prophets. One of his sons, so one of Elijah's spiritual grandsons, anointed a new king of Israel, and his name was Jehu. You know what Jehu did? Jehu dethroned Jezebel. I want to say this. I believe a spirit of Jezebel, not through a person, but a spirit of Jezebel has suffered a defeat in our nation, but has not yet been dethroned in our nation. We cannot stop now. We have got to pour into the generations that are coming. Because they're going to arise and possess the Lamb. They're going to arise and dethrone Jezebel. And our nation will be resplendent with His glory. And so I believe what God wants to do in our lives today, number one, is re-envision us with what the initial call was. Not what we've settled for because this happened and that happened and this happened and that happened. What was the initial call? Because God has the ability to restore Everything, including the years the enemy ate. And then God wants to give us, I believe, a vision to raise up a generation. To see truly the kingdom of God come on earth as in heaven. Stand with me if you would. Kim should kind of come join me. Thank you for your indulgence of time. Father, we bless you. And God, we thank you that, Lord, what you are doing in this day and this hour... 
Lord is calling us into a season of accomplishment, a season of victory, a season of finishing what has begun. God, we have been apostolic and starting and pioneering and breaking through, but may we be apostolic and finishing the course. But Father, sometimes we've settled for getting off course. We've settled because we're no longer in the past. But Lord, we've gotten comfortable. And Lord, you're telling us to get up and finish the journey. You're telling us to not just enjoy the spoils of the battle won yesterday, but to get up and fight the battles of tomorrow. Lord, you're telling us not just to celebrate the fire and celebrate the rain, but God, to raise up a generation and generations that will dethrone the principalities and powers through the kingship of Christ. God, we pray that in these next moments, you would speak to individuals to stir up the initial call, the initial fire, the initial vision. It's the Holy Spirit come. Stir us out of our place of being settled. We give you thanks, Lord. Let me ask just a very simple question. God has purpose and destiny for every one of us. We understand that. And many of us have said, I'm going to go after God with all of my heart. But you know, even when we have that, we find that sometimes we give up on the initial vision because we've made a mistake there or the enemy uh, uh, sidetracked us there. If you're in a place where you say, I've given up on the initial vision. I'm still going after God. But it's, it's like I've given up and thought, God, that will never happen. And God, I want you to restore the initial purpose and destiny you had for my life. Remember the Bible says, before we were ever born, God wrote every day of our life in the books of heaven. If you want to come back to what God wrote for your life, before you were ever born. And you say, I need that revelation. I need that revelation today. Lift your hand, please. I want you to come join us standing here. We're not going to call people out individually at this point. But what we want to do is pray for God to bring a release of the initial call, the initial vision, the initial passion, the initial fire. So Father, we thank you now, guys, you understand the prophetic. We don't live our lives by prophecy. We don't stand around waiting to get our word. Jesus is the word. He's in us by his spirit. But when a prophecy comes, we test it according to the word of God. We listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit inside of us to confirm it. We go to our spiritual fathers and mothers who give answer to our, over our souls so that they can speak into it. But God is a God that speaks. He's a God that stirs in us. And so, God, we pray that tonight you would renew the vision. Renew the work in our days.